How's it going everybody? It's Guillermo here from ScreenRealm.com. You're about to watch a video interview that our writer Adam Fleet was able to conduct with Phil Tippett. The visionary, Oscar and Emmy award winning stop motion animator and special effects supervisor. And the creative powerhouse involved with such classics as Robocop, Starship Troopers, Jurassic Park, Star Wars A New Hope, The Empire Strikes Back, the list goes on. Adam talks to Phil about his new film Mad Guard, an experimental stop motion animated film set in a world of monsters, mad scientists and war pigs. The film is being released on streaming service Shudder on June 16th and in the description below you can also find a link to Adam's review of the film which he gave four and a half out of five stars. That's it from me, enjoy. Congratulations on uh, Mad God by the way, I've, I've seen it a couple of times, it is uh, an astonishing film, it's really fantastic so congrats on that. Infamously uh, you started it 30 years ago, is, is the finished movie what you envisioned when you embarked on this project no i didn't know what i was doing and you know like many artists you know they they just don't know what they're doing you know at, at all and uh i i mean i had a vibe i uh 30 years ago i had uh, written down um a very brief 12 page treatment of it that was more like a tone kind of a thing uh, but it had kind of all the high water marks in it of basically what I wanted to do. And uh, the late 80s, I shot about three minutes of footage on three, uh, 35 millimeter film. And then um, I had to do my day job and the digital revolution hit. And so I had to work on my day job and go out on location and shoot movies and uh, do the post-production on them and pre-production whatnot. You know, when I had days off or on the weekends or in the evenings, I would work on developing characters and storyboards. Ken Rogers and the editor and I just found a piece that was uh, very early uh, uh, put together, uh, a reel of the thing, about 10 minutes that had those first three minutes, just a bunch of storyboards. And it really was surprising to me how really close it, it, it was to what I, you know, wanted to do once we restarted the pro project. And uh, so uh, 10, 12 plus years ago, I was um, archiving the, the you know, little bit that I had shot and uh, some of the guys at my studio were looking over my shoulder and they'd always wanted to work with, uh, you know, uh, film and uh, models and miniatures who were inspired by Star Wars and RoboCop, you know, making of. And they um, offered to do a, a shot for it. And so I reconstructed the main character that we called the Assassin. And they did a shot and then they did another shot and one thing led to the next and they got a bunch of volunteers. And then over the next 12 years, you know, uh, we made it and uh, now it's finally done. Did a lot of this imagery just kind of evolve or organically as you, as you were making it or, or, or presumably from what you're saying, if you only had a, a short storyboard at the beginning, a lot of this stuff came out during the production? Yeah, I had a pretty strong, well, if you look back at this, um, you know, piece that we did, the you know, 10 minute piece with storyboards, I mean, it's, it's, it really surprised me is, uh, you know, how accurate that was to what ended up on the screen. And uh, it, it just took that, that much time since around, you know, 2012 ish to, uh, Get it all together and it was just a really slow burn you know sometimes on the weekends i would get as many as like um 15 to 20 people to come in and th these were people that i picked up giving talks around the bay area and whatnot most of them didn't have any experience working with tools and um so i i would spend during the week a little bit of time you know figuring out what the processes would be and, um, and then on the weekends when they would show up, I would show them. And I couldn't have done it without them because a lot of the stuff was so involved and, and tedious. Um, one of the, the 
sets was uh, uh, you know these hills and mountains of dead army men or soldiers, and uh, that was took a you know between four and six people over three years to to build. And, wow. uh, you know, did I spot an Ed 209 in, in the cemetery at, at the beginning of, uh, of the film when he descends into the first level? Indeed you did. Yeah, I thought, yeah, that, I and, thought so. Um, I think there's a Terminator in there and there's a Robocop laying around. There's a bunch of stuff. Any, anything, you know, any of the toys I had laying around. Oh, brilliant. I just, um, I just robbed from everything all the time. <laughs> nice one. Um, does uh, I believe earlier in early in your career you got to meet uh, Ray Harryhausen? Um, mm -hmm. Does teaching your crew on Mad God how to do the stop motion animation feel like uh, kind of you've come full circle from being able to pick Ray Harryhausen's um, brain early on in your career to now teaching people how to do it? Well, R Ray would never divulge his secrets, even after we all knew what his secrets were. We would never <laughs> talk about it, and. Um, because he he uh, was evoking the magician, you know, and he was very old school in that regard, and just like the magic was, circle, yeah, didn't want to give away your tricks. And you don't teach anybody stop motion work. People, you know, came to me that had done a little bit of stop motion work, you know, some students and uh, other filmmakers that were kind of at like level one. And so, uh, yeah, by the time we ended up, yeah, they were really proficient. Some of them have their own businesses now. Fantastic. When the, uh, effect, the stop motion effects were replaced on uh, Jurassic Park with, with the CGI, you uh, have said Jurassic Park was a shot in the head that killed stop motion. Um, so does Mad God feel like vindication in a way, not just for yourself, but for the medium as a whole? No, no, I was, that, that whole scene was with Jurassic was, I was very over emotional and kind of projected the worst scenario, but that's just the way the, the dice rolled. So everything that I did subsequently, uh, you know, for uh, my day job was uh, with computer graphics. I, I never actually did any of the work myself because I'm, I just am an idiot on the <laughs> computer and um but, you know, by that time I'd been kicked upstairs. So I was like a, a supervisor and I could direct people. Yeah, that's kind of how, how that, you know, went down. I was just really lucky to get these, these folks to, to contribute. Another interesting thing you said uh, in, in a documentary that I watched on you was that um, when you were making Return of the Jedi, um, you did, uh, took LSD with your cat um, while you were working on that movie. And, and I wondered if you had taken any similarly psychedelic approaches to Mad God, because there's certainly a lot of imagery in there that uh, looks like you might no, have come the, the LSD was a one-time thing, you know. I'm I'm like 70 now, and I'm you know I'm I've been thinking about it for a while, and I thought, well, when I turn 70, maybe I'll try it again. Uh, and then, no, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of on the fence about it. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. I don't want to change my brain too much at this point in time because I'm I'm kind of locked into some other stuff that I want to do, and I don't want any interference. My friend a Adam Savage, you know, uh, when we were talking about LSD experiences, he was you know telling me that uh, Timothy Leary, when they did their experiments, always made sure that there was somebody you know in the room in case they started to go off. And, you know, a Adam had um, a few bad trips. And I said, well, I guess I was lucky because, uh, you know, I was alone and I didn't, I didn't flip out. And he said, well, that's because you had Brian the cat with you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, you know? And if you pull people and ask them what, what are uh, the most significant uh, events in your life way high up on the list is having children and taking acid oh I'm, I'm glad that i'm glad brian the cat was uh, was able to make sure you had <laughs> yeah, a pleasant experience no we had a great time fantastic um i i'd like to just uh, quickly uh, ask a question about robocop if, if that's all right um yep. uh, 
as many people of my age, I'm sure, it's very formative movie for me. I've, I've got a Robocop tattoo there. I don't know if you can see that. but um, Yeah, I can see it. How old were you when you saw Robocop? Oh, uh, I was too young. Like, I, I had, <laughs> that was a movie, like, I thought that was definitely exclusive to my school. It was the cool thing to have seen Robocop, right? But thanks to the internet, that seems to be a global phenomenon. Everybody of my age uh. saw that movie way too young. Um, they made a really cool 80s toy line on that that came out of the cartoons, I think. There was an Ed 209 toy spotted on the internet today. I wondered how the irony sat with you of like the most anti-capitalist sci-fi horror movie out there being merchandised and, and turned into kids' TV and toys and that kind of thing. I think it's pretty amusingly ironic that that happened. Yeah, I mean, that's what happens. You know, you can't avoid it. You know, if there's any money to be made, you know, they'll, you know, attempt to, you know, claw as much as they can. Yeah, I think the point they were making in the film as well, isn't it? Um, okay, I've got to note that we've got two minutes left. So uh, I, I think uh, that's probably a good time to uh, wrap it up. Thank you very much for your time, sure. Phil. It's been uh, a pleasure talking to you and uh, chatting about the brilliant Mad God. Okay, thanks. Cheers, Phil. Cheers, Phil.